Well, good morning, my excellent friends. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we today? Ooh, that was less enthusiastic than when I asked you how you were before. Did the worship set tire you out a little bit? Well, I am super excited to be here with you this morning. We are going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at verse 22, actually, not 26 like we did with the reading. So go back to, to verse 22 and join me there because last week we left off in the middle of the story. And I want to jump right in here because there are some very valuable things for us to see. So, to recap, in case you weren't here last week, okay, David is king of Judah. Ishbosheth, which is a hard name to say, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, has been crowned king of the rest of Israel by Saul's general, Abner. And last week we saw Ishbosheth make a big mistake. He accused Abner, the guy who made him king, of sleeping with one of Saul's concubines, basically accusing Abner of treason and seeking the throne for himself. And Abner did not take the accusation very well. Now, whether that is a result of Abner's guilt or innocence is not really revealed to us in the text. But in response to Ishbosheth's accusation, Abner sought out David and promised an allegiance between the two of them to deliver the entire kingdom, the rest of Israel, into David's hands. We even saw Abner working behind the scenes to make that transfer of power even smoother. And then we left off last week at verse 21, where it says, So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Now look at those last five words of that sentence. Okay, go ahead and take a good look. Okay, that, my friends, is what we call foreshadowing. In fact, those words are actually very ominous, but we don't know it yet. And they're ominous because as we continue reading, it says, Just then, David's men and Joab returned from a raid and brought with them a great deal of plunder. But Abner was no longer with David in Hebron because David had sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the soldiers with him arrived, he was told that Abner, son of Ner, had come to the king and that the king had sent him away and that he had gone in peace. Now this is not good. And I hope you can feel the tension building in this passage here. Okay, did you notice? It repeats twice more that Abner had gone away in peace. The text is telling us that something is coming. Okay, just as a refresher, remember what happened the last time Joab and Abner met. Okay, a giant battle happened. Abner killed Joab's brother Asahel, and it was only because Joab didn't wish for his fellow Israelites to continue killing each other that he stopped pursuing Abner seeking revenge. The beef between those two has not been squashed. Joab is still angry at Abner for killing his brother, and he still wants revenge. And the men in the army know that. And so as soon as Joab and his men come back from the raid that they were on, they are promptly informed of the scandal that has just occurred. Abner, the mortal enemy of David and his men, came to the king and has left without even a slap on the wrist. When Joab hears this news, I imagine that he turns into one of those cartoon characters. You know, you could see his neck turning red. And then the red spreads into his face, and then all of a sudden, boop, psh, the steam starts coming out of his ears. He must be fuming. You're telling me the guy who murdered my brother came to David, and David let him go? So, Joab went to the king and said, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why did you let him go? Now he's gone. You know Abner, son of Ner. He came to deceive you and observe your movements and find out everything you're doing. Now this is bold on Joab's part. In fact, it's almost shockingly bold. 
David is the king. One does not speak to the king like this. At least one ought not speak to the king like this. Joab basically tells David that he's an idiot and that he just got played for a fool by Abner. That is not something that you should say to the king unless if, if you're fond of your head. And when we see Joab's behavior here, we should stop and wonder what in the world could possess someone to speak so boldly to the king. The, the man who we have seen in the past order the death of someone at a moment's notice, and that was actually even before he was king. And while it may be true that perhaps Joab's anger about his brother's murderer getting away scot-free could have motivated this, what we will see as we progress here is that may not be the only reason that Joab doesn't fear speaking to the king like this. Joab is very secure in his position. And so he doesn't fear David like he should. Also notice the reasons that Joab gives for being upset about Abner's escape. He says that he believes Abner came to spy on David and his men. Is that the real reason that Joab is upset? Mm-mm. Joab wants revenge. But what we'll see as we progress through 2 Samuel is that just like Abner, Joab is a schemer. And so in his scheming mind, he knows that he can't just say to David, he killed my brother and you let him go. That might be a powerful reason for Joab personally, for his frustration, but it does not speak to anyone other than Joab and maybe his brother Abishai. Joab knows as a schemer, that he can't reveal the true reason he's upset, so he tells David that Abner only came to spy on them. Now let me ask you this. How does Joab know that? He wasn't even there when Abner came around. It isn't like he saw the way Abner was behaving or, or saw Abner taking note of certain things while he was among David's men. So how could he reach that conclusion? How does he know that this was Abner's intention? Ah, you see, that's what Joab would have done if he was in Abner's position. What we see here is one schemer recognizing another schemer. Joab judges Abner based on himself. Now, we see this all the time. Okay? In fact, it is even uh, in a very popular book by a guy named Saul Alinsky called Rules for Radicals. The, the, the rule is you accuse your opponents of what you are doing yourself. Okay, and if you're paying attention during this political cycle, you will see that all over the place. Okay, but more importantly than that, this is a life lesson that we should all learn. More often than not, people judge others based on what they themselves would do in a similar situation. Most times, it's actually not even fair to the other person and truthfully actually reveals more to us about the person making the accusation than about the person that's being accused. Okay. Keep that in mind as you live your life. But that is exactly what Joab is doing here. He uses the knowledge of what he would have done in Abner's situation and uses it to accuse Abner of something that there is no evidence for. Okay. None found in scripture and definitely none that Joab has at the moment that he's making this accusation. And he does it to try and provide some kind of justification for what he thinks should have been done while Abner was there. He does it to distract away from the real reason that he's upset, revenge. So watch out for schemers. It says, Joab then left David. Okay, and stop right there, because I want us to notice something here. Notice what David did not do. What did David, the king, not do? He didn't do anything to reprimand Joab. David is the king, and he has just been told that he got played for a fool and acted like an idiot. And David does nothing to punish, jo uh, punish Joab for speaking to him like that. Joab showed complete and utter disrespect to the king, and David did nothing in response. He didn't stand up and say, how dare you 
speak to me in that manner. You don't know what you're talking about, dude. In fact, you weren't even here, nor were you privy to the conversation that was had between Abner and I. Okay, or if you will, for my wrestling fans, he didn't say, shut your mouth and know your role. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what position you might have. It doesn't matter whose son you may be. You do not speak to me like that, son. David does nothing. Keep that in mind as we continue here. It says, Joab then left David and sent messengers after Abner. Mm -mm. And they brought him back from the cistern at Sirah. But David didn't know it. Now, when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into an inner chamber as if to speak with him privately. And there, to avenge the blood of his brother Asahel, Joab stabbed him in the stomach, and he died. So Joab, in frustration with the king, and having received no reprimand for his conduct thus far, motivated by vengeance, hatches another scheme. He sends messengers to Abner, who's still on his way back to Israel, asking him to come back once more to discuss some things further. And Abner obliges, believing that these messengers are most likely from David. And so he's not suspecting the foul plot that is afoot. And when he returns, Joab makes a show of wanting to talk to him privately. Abner most likely thinking that Joab wants to squash the beef between the two of them. And when Joab has Abner alone, he kills him by stabbing him in the stomach. A few verses later, Joab's brother Abishai is also included in the guilt of this crime, so it's possible that he also maybe played a role, maybe even directly, uh, in this, maybe waiting in ambush in that room that Joab took Abner to. So in his quest for vengeance, Joab murders a man in cold blood. I want us to all note the differences here between the killing of Asahel by Abner and the killing of Abner by Joab. Asahel was killed by Abner in the heat of battle. And after Abner tried to dissuade Asahel from pursuing him. Okay. Now you can argue that perhaps Abner was simply actually taunting Asahel and trying to get him to keep pursuing him. But I do actually think that Abner, the older guy, was a little concerned that Asahel, the really fast guy, was going to catch up to him and dispatch him. I think there was actual genuine concern in Abner's plea to Asahel. Now, okay, that's Abner killing Asahel. Let's look at Joab killing Abner. Okay? This is not a battle. In fact, Abner has just reached peace terms with David. He came under the flag of truce, and therefore, the rules of warfare decree he should be safe from any harm. But Joab ignores all of that and kills Abner in cold blood out of revenge. This is a serious thing. By doing this, Joab could be jeopardizing everything that David just accomplished by making peace with Abner. This could vastly prolong David being crowned king of all Israel. It would be entirely reasonable for the elders of Israel to say, we had a deal but you have now broken the terms of that deal, and so the agreement is off. Joab, motivated by revenge, is risking an awful lot here. And that's because he's not thinking of anything but his own personal quest for vengeance. So Joab has killed Abner, who was under David's protection, and he killed him in cold blood. Now in truth, this all probably could have been avoided had David just put Joab in his place when he spoke to him as disrespectfully as he did. Okay, but let's see how David responds when he hears the news that Joab has killed Abner. It says, later, when David heard about this, he said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May his blood fall on the head of Joab and on his whole family. May Joab's family never be without someone who has a running sore or leprosy or who leans on a crutch or who falls by the sword or who lacks food. 
So when David hears of Joab's treachery, he pronounces a curse on him and his entire family for all eternity. He absolves himself of any guilt and calls down what is actually a rather harsh curse upon Joab and his kin. Okay, and as we look at the curse, we should notice that it is quite severe. Okay, and we may question, why is this curse so harsh? Cursing Joab, I mean, I'm sure we can probably understand that, but his entire family for generations? That seems a lot. And to understand that, we need to go all the way back to the book of Joshua. And there we find that Hebron, the city where they are right now, the city where Joab killed Abner, is one of the cities listed as a city of refuge. So first, David's curse is so severe because Joab killed a man that was under his protection. David sent Abner away under the promise that no harm would come to him, and Joab violated that command of the king. But more so, Joab has violated the command of God by killing Abner in a city of refuge. Cities of refuge were meant to be places that someone could flee if that person had killed someone and be assured of safety from the one seeking vengeance for them killing that person once the due legal process was done. That's, that's part of the say, say, sanctuary cities is a, is a term out there today. Hey, that's the part that they miss, the due legal process happening. Okay, But that is part of what sanctuary cities are supposed to do. C cities of refuge are supposed to do. There's still supposed to be that legal process. Okay, So Joab violated not only David's command, but God. If there was any place where Abner should have been safe, it was in Hebron, a city of refuge. And so David calls down this extremely severe curse to bring attention to the seriousness of the situation. But did you notice what David didn't do? What should have happened to Joab for killing Abner? Yeah, he should have been killed. No if, ands, buts, or coconuts. Joab has committed outright murder. And the punishment for murder is death. David should have called down his men upon Joab and had him killed the moment that he heard what Joab did. But he doesn't. Now why not? Well, some might say that Joab is family. So it would be too hard for David to call such a judgment down upon a member of his own family. And I think there is some validity there. As we progress to the story of David's life, we're going to see that he does have some particular weaknesses. One is men, and another is family. So it could be possible that part of the reason that David does not punish Joab is because uh, Joab is his nephew. But more interestingly, David actually gives us a glimpse into his thought process a little later in the text. He says, the sons of Zeruiah, that's Joab and Abishai, are too strong for him. So it would seem that the real reason that David doesn't administer justice, the justice that Joab's crime deserves, is that he is worried that he will order his men to kill Joab, and nobody's going to step up to do it. He is afraid that maybe his men aren't really his men. They're actually Joab's men. Joab is the commander of the army, after all. It would seem that David is actually not much more secure in his position as king as Ishbosheth was in his. David fears Joab and Abishai because the army is with them. In fact, we will see David administer the justice that is due Joab and Abishai. Sorry, we will not see him do that. And it will become a problem. It will become a huge problem for David as things progress. This moment right here that we are in in this text is a pivotal moment for David. And his failure to act as he should have neuters his kingdom going forward. It is not until David is on his deathbed and is giving advice to his son that's going to succeed him, Solomon, that David finally decrees that Joab must answer for this crime that we're reading about right here. We're talking decades later. 
And on top of that, in cowardly fashion, David places that burden on his son to enact that justice. Because he knows that if his son doesn't do it, Solomon's position as king will be just as compromised as his was because of Joab and Abishai. And it's all because he didn't do what needed to be done right here at this moment. This is the moment in the story where I really start to become frustrated with David. Because over his life, David develops a real sense of decision paralysis. And we see the beginnings of it taking root right here. Then, once the curse has been pronounced, so once David pronounces the curse on Joab for what he's done, David holds a large funeral ceremony for Abner. A ceremony like that of an important figure of state. And he forces Joab to mourn for the man that he just killed. All the while making sure to show everyone that he's saddened by this event and that he had no hand in it. He even writes a lament, a song for Abner. I and mean, we've seen David do this before for Saul and Jonathan. And this lament uh, is nowhere near as uh, long or as ornate as that one. But it is a major thing that David would compose a song to mourn Abner's death. And so moving is this song that it actually makes everyone who hears it weep for Abner. And then to drive the point home even further, that he had nothing to do with Abner's murder, David entered a fast to mourn Abner. And when the people come and, and, and just beg him to eat something, he refuses as a sign of respect and mourning for Abner. And all these signs work. It says, all the people took note and were pleased and, and pleased. Indeed, everything the king did pleased them. So on that day, all the people there and all Israel knew that the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Ner. All Israel is sure that David is innocent. Note that. Okay. It's not just Judah in Hebron where David is. The things that David has done to assure others of his innocence in this matter reach the entire nation. And all the kingdom is sure that David is innocent of any guilt. Now, to be sure this is not the end of the story. And David's actions here uh, in this passage... Uh, or more importantly, his lack of action here in this passage, will have ramifications that will echo down throughout all of David's life. But that's where we're going to stop this week. And when I look at this passage, I can't help but be shocked by what the quest for revenge can cause someone to do. Joab could have really messed a lot of stuff up here, couldn't he? In seeking vengeance, he could have uh, caused the establishment of the kingdom under David to be delayed by a considerable amount. Okay, now don't get it twisted. God has promised David that the kingdom is going to be his, and God will fulfill that promise because he is faithful. Amen. But Joab's actions could have really complicated that. It would have been perfectly reasonable for the elders of Israel to assume that Joab, the commander of David's army, was acting on David's behalf and gone back on their desire to make David their king. Abner came to you under a flag of truce, and that's how you treat him? More to the point, it would have been completely reasonable for the leaders of Judah to assume that Joab was acting on David's behalf and to take back their allegiance from David. Abner came to you under a flag of truce, and after you have consolidated an alliance with him, then you kill him? If that's how you treat your allies, we don't want anything to do with you. Joab's actions could have resulted in David being brought back down to square one. No kingdom. In exile again. Now, thanks to David's actions and the grace of God, that didn't happen. Still, that's a lot to be risking for a personal quest for vengeance. And that strikes me because it shows how clouded our vision can become when vengeance fills our hearts and our eyes. It can make us behave in utterly harmful ways to everybody around us. 
Now, I'm not going to get politically, I, mean, I, I, I might get a little politi politically incorrect here, okay? But we saw this firsthand for an entire summer almost four years ago. Our entire nation was enveloped in massive riots in almost all the major cities because hordes of people believed that vengeance needed to be enacted and they took it into their own hands. Now, truthfully, I actually don't want to speak to the political nature of that. I want to speak to you all about the spiritual nature of all of that. And the truth of the matter is, spiritually, those people engaged in those riots because they have or had a deficiency in their spiritual foundation. They sought vengeance themselves, but vengeance is not ours to take. The one true God reserves that for himself. And I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that he does. I am thankful that the one true faithful witness and judge is the one who claims the right to enact vengeance for himself. And you should be thankful for that too. What it means is when vengeance does come, it's coming out of justice, not simply a desire for revenge. When God avenges... He does so out of his righteous character. It is not our job to take that responsibility away from God. Now, I don't want to be socially insensitive either here, so I understand the injustices that those who participated in those riots believed that they were correcting. They didn't correct them, just so we're clear. But I understand. Okay, and I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with those sentiments, but I understand where they're coming from. But we must always remember that vengeance belongs to God and not us, no matter how egregious the offense might be. Now, why did those people have that warped view about the nature of vengeance and justice? Well, firstly, they had that view because it's part of our sinful nature to seek revenge. That's just part of how we are. We, get back, we just want to get back at those who do us wrong. But more to the point... They had that flawed view because Christians, people like you and me, have failed in our mission to show them the truth of God and his justice. More so than that, we fail to even behave in that knowledge ourselves. How could those people possibly have an understanding when it comes to allowing God room to enact justice when we don't even allow him that room ourselves. So here's my question to all of you in the room and everybody listening on the internet. What grudge are you holding against somebody? Against whom do you hold an offense? Who are you seeking vengeance from? Hey, don't, don't be coy. I know we all hold grudges. Okay? More than that, I know we all feel justified in the grudges that we hold. I know that we convince ourselves that we are justified in seeking vengeance in our own small way. Maybe uh, something as simple as just treating somebody different than we treat everybody else. Maybe it's trying to stop that person that we hold that grudge against from participating in some ministry. We all do things like that. Listen to me. Let vengeance belong to God. Okay. You may be right. That person may have actually done you wrong. Abner killed Joab's brother, for crying out loud. But in his quest for vengeance, Joab jeopardized the entire kingdom. Don't let that be you. I think it's also important for us to recognize as we look at this text, the danger we do when we delay confronting sin. Now, in this passage, we, we can see it in two places. That's two. Two places. The most obvious is when David refuses to punish Joab as is fitting for the nature of his crime. That David refuses to execute Joab for killing Abner, no matter what the reason is, whether it's because Joab was his nephew or because he was uh, afraid that he would give the order, kill Joab, and no one would do it. No matter what the reason, this decision echoes throughout the rest of David's 
life. In David's position, in truth, David's position is never totally secure because the sons of Zeruiah are always right there. Now, just as a side, really quick, I just want to be, I just want to clear something up in relation to the last point, because I can already hear what some of you are thinking. Okay? He said, he said not to enact revenge, but now he's saying that David should have killed Joab for what he did. Just to be clear, Joab, uh, David, I'm sorry, would not have been acting out of vengeance, but out of justice. Justice based on the commands found in the word of God, and not based on his own personal feelings. Okay, hope that clears things up. You are not off the hook from unjustly seeking revenge against somebody. But the truth of the matter is, the real place in this story where David loses the plot is not when he fails to execute Joab for what he did. It's when he doesn't put Joab in his place when Joab reprimanded David. Just play with me here. Had David put Joab in his place, and made it clear that Abner was not to be touched by order of the king in front of everybody, would Joab have had the audacity to then still go and kill Abner? We don't know. But we don't know because David didn't do it. Now, maybe he didn't do it, for the same reasons that he didn't execute Joab. He's family. He has the support of the army. But no matter the reason, he didn't do it. I hope you can see the danger we bring when we don't confront sin when it shows itself. Joab was sinning by disrespecting the king. David should have put him in his place. Didn't. And that left the door wide open for Joab to do what he did. It is imperative that we as Christians firstly recognize sin in our own lives and confront it head on. Otherwise, it will take root and leave us open to the danger it poses. But it's also important for us to hold each other accountable as brothers and sisters. We are a family, a team. All of us have blind spots. That's why we fellowship together, so that I can cover yours, and you can cover mine. It does us no good if we don't warn each other of our blind spots. We must confront sin before it takes hold or else we are subjecting ourselves, and our brothers and sisters, to danger. Now, sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's difficult to confront someone you love, but we must never be more concerned with what others might think than we are of exposing sin and revealing truth. This is where I turn into that cartoon character, like Joab did. Hey, Pete mentioned last week how one of the two main political parties has changed their stance on the topic of abortion to no longer being that we shouldn't kill any babies, to being you know, maybe killing some babies is okay. And if you listen to any of them talk about the issue, they will tell you that the position was changed because they didn't think they could win elections if they continued to take the old position. In other words, they changed it because they were afraid of what others thought. They abandoned what was right for what was politically expedient. Okay, can you see the steam coming out of my ears yet? What makes it worse is that many of those people that I have heard say that the position uh, needed to change claim to be Christians. As Christians, we must never let the fear of what others think stop us from confronting sin. If we don't confront sin, we put ourselves and everyone around us, in this case, innocent little babies, in danger. The final thing that I think is important for us to notice is linked to that very point. I am struck by how much David goes out of his way to make sure that everyone knows that he is innocent when it comes to Abner's death. He makes it so that there can be no doubt about the fact that he had no hand in this treacherous act. So much so that the entire kingdom, even those who are his enemies right now, know 
that David is innocent. That must be how we behave as Christians in the world. We may not be kings like David is, but we do represent one. And what others think of the character of our king is dictated by us. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Ephesians. But among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place. I hear some of you squirming in your seats because of the coarse joking part there. We tend to do that. Or perhaps maybe, okay, that, that's Paul to the Ephesians, maybe we should go back to the source. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Seems like an impossible standard, right? Well, the truth of the matter is, none of us will ever be perfect here on earth. But that's not the point. It's about the goal. We suffer from a plague in our society, a plague of low expectations. What we started doing, and I don't even know when it started, but it's all over the place now, is what we do is we set our expectations low. That way, we won't be disappointed because we've set them so low that it's basically a given that we're going to meet those expectations. The problem is, by setting our standards so low, we condition ourselves not to aim any higher. We disincentivize striving for excellence. Here's a lesson from my life. Okay? When I was in school, the standard that was expected of me was perfection. Okay? When I got a 97 on the test and I handed it to my parents, they would say, why didn't you get 100? Now understand that that may seem harsh, but understand they didn't do it in a way to put me down and make me feel bad, but rather they did it to show me that I was actually capable of even better and that they had faith in me that I could achieve that. That is the standard that God places on us. We must be perfect. Will we ever reach that goal? Not entirely, but with God's help, we can come close. But the thing is, we have to try. We have to set that standard. We represent a king. His character is reflected in ours. So go forth and make sure that you leave no doubt, like David did in his text, about the character of the king that you serve. Stop setting low expectations. Set the standard high to be like Christ.